Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, I'm Henyu from Asher Consulting. I work as a project manager here, and we offer holistic uh, consulting and market research uh, for companies, and we're based all across the APAC region. For today's uh, webinar, we're focusing on the metaverse, and in particular, the metaverse in China. Um, for today's agenda, by the end of the webinar, we hope that you will learn about first the general state of the metaverse in China and what exactly is the metaverse, um, what are certain technologies that are able to be leveraged and the current technologies in development that will be useful for you in the future, um, as well as how certain technologies are already being leveraged by many businesses and companies in China. Uh, lastly, uh, we'll also be covering some uh, key cases or uh, case studies of how NFTs uh, virtual events and meta humans are being currently being applied in the market. Um, today, co hosting is Sharon from IO Consulting. Hello, everyone. I'm Sharon from AYO Consulting, and I uh, mainly do uh, digital transformation and the corporate innovation projects with MMCs. Uh, thank you for Dashue for inviting us to join this webinar today. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sharon, and let's jump right into it. So for the content outline, the webinar today will be divided mostly into four parts. So first, we want to uh, give you a general understanding of what the metaverse is and what it means in China. Uh, second, an overview of the technology, as well as the key players currently leading the industry. And third is the current applications for it in the retail. So the metaverse is quite a complex topic. And usually when people talk about the metaverse, they confuse it for something that's tangible and something that's, uh, I would say, applicable. But rather, I think the correct way to understand it is more of a concept, right? So by definition, the metaverse is the virtual world hosted on the internet, interconnected via VR, AR, blockchain, and other technologies. Um, and uh, meta opportunities arise in a wide variety of industries. But the way that we need to kind of understand what the metaverse is, is that it's the conglomeration or amalgamation between the real and virtual world. And how we want to define the metaverse is really up to how we view the application. So to give a quick example, um, many, many years ago in the toys industry, there was a toys to life trend. So what this was, was people could purchase real physical toys which they were able to then scan into a virtual version of a video game. And they were able to use these characters uh, in the game. And at that time, this was many, many years ago, there was really no concept of the metaverse. But today, if we were to apply the same concepts, um, that would for sure and definitely be what we can recognize as an application of the metaverse. So again, there are some central uh, pins that uh, kind of uh, construct of what we know as a metaverse. So first is uh, the decentralization aspect. So when we talk about decentralization, um, it's kind of separated in two parts. So one is the, I would say, technological aspect of it. So in order to uh, support the metaverse, um, there needs to be a decentralization of technology. So uh, when we're talking about 5G technology and cloud computing, to support the mass uh, amounts of data transfer, there needs to be decentralization of operation. Um, second, we need to talk about blockchain. So what makes metaverse, I think, such a hot topic in today's time is the blockchain technology. So before there was, it was difficult um, to prove real ownership over virtual ass uh, assets. So um, it wasn't completely tamper-proof and there were many uh, I think, complications when it comes to claiming digital ownership. But through the implementation of blockchain technology, there is now an unprecedented opportunity to really claim ownership of digital aspects. And that's what's really making the metaverse feasible in today's context. So um, here we can kind of look at uh, what the metaverse kind of looks like uh, globally uh, as compared to China. So um, globally, uh, the way we understand it, it's a very user-driven community. It's a very user-driven uh, industry where most of uh, the content is being created by individuals. Um, and it is the individuals that are kind of contributing to the, uh, to the ecosystem and to the community of the metaverse through developments of own applications and own softwares. And in particular, when we talk about games, there, uh, uh, there are certain cases, for example, sandbox uh, players are creating their own assets and their own designs within the game. 
Um, this is the West, but when we take into consideration uh, the Chinese environment, uh, especially the political space, there's very uh, limited opportunities for individuals to actually manipulate uh, metaverse uh, and metaverse assets. So an example of uh, a special case of this is the Zhuhai Sandbox. So it's not uh, yet implemented, but it's a concept that was inspired by Roblox business model. So this is an opportunity for people to, through this platform, develop their own digital assets, apps, and perhaps mini games. Um, so the issue with this is that uh, it hasn't yet actually been actualized. So a quote I like to reference um, is, so when the internet developed, uh, it was regulated afterwards. Um, but for the metaverse, it's being regulated as it develops. So we can see this uh, in actuality with the uh, NFTs and cryptocurrency, which uh, while initially was not really monitored in China, suddenly um, it was banned and that really shifted the whole uh, environment in China. So we need to be cautious when approaching certain concepts such as uh, user generated content in the metaverse because uh, of the uh, spontaneous policy shifts and policy implementations in China. So that's something that should be kept in mind when imagining the metaverse in China. So um, obviously I think the most uh, prevalent uh, mentions for the metaverse is gaming um, just because of how applicable it is with the current technology. But there are some other uh, industries that should not be ignored. So first is finance. Um, as you know, uh, cryptocurrency currently is uh, banned in China. So uh, the replacement or the alternative in China currently is the CNY or digital RMB. Uh, currently, it is not yet widespread or widely implemented, but um, in certain test areas, they're trying to implement this new form of currency, which will be essentially the replacement of cryptocurrencies in the Chinese digital space. Um, next would be tourism. So tourism currently uh, is more of a concept and more of an idea than something that's very practical. So uh, in certain cases, people have re uh, replicated certain uh, Chinese historical sites, uh, tourism spots for um, people to enjoy via virtual reality or the metaverse. Um, the technology as of now uh, makes a very interesting experience, but uh, for it to be fully immersive or I would say uh, even competitive to real tourism, uh, there's still ways to go. Um, next is fashion. Uh, I think fashion is one of the most interesting opportunities for metaverse application uh, in the current age. That's because the technology has enabled certain uh, uh, apps or softwares to be implemented in very, very innovative uh, and uh, interesting ways. So one example would be uh, virtual try-ons. So this can range from shoes to clothes to um, potentially even makeup and beauty. And this gives uh, consumers a very uh, uh, interesting opportunity. I would say even the opportunity itself is a form of marketing. So consumers can try on shoes and clothes within the comforts of their own home. Um, and this has certainly been accelerated by the pandemic and lockdowns in China. Um, lastly, we can go over a bit uh, advertising. So advertising, uh, so we talk about mostly uh, metahumans. So metahumans are basically virtual humans constructed uh, to appear extremely lifelike. And they have been used uh, in major campaigns, uh, not just in China, but uh, internationally and to great success. Um, so here is China's positive perception of the metaverse. So what's interesting is that uh, in surveys, we found that uh, the positive perception of Chinese people towards the opinion of extended reality is 28%, the global average. And this is not actually something surprising because if we look at China's current uh, digital landscape or even way of life, we can see numerous uh, aspects and numerous places where the concept of metaverse or the merging of the virtual and the physical has already been taking place. So one example would be uh, China's WeChat and Alipay. So it's basically um, a digital wallet for people to make transactions. through, um, And its penetration rate is unlike any other digital form of payment uh, anywhere else in the world. Um, also, we see uh, just um, some of the e-commerce shopping platforms. So uh, MetaHuman, live streamers, uh, even VTubers, um, it's much more of a norm here in China than anywhere else in the world. So in some way, the Chinese population has already been acclimated to the concept of uh, the metaverse, which is why um, China presents kind of an unprecedented opportunity as opposed to the rest of the world currently for metaverse applications. Um, next uh, is 
kind of we want to emphasize on how much the Chinese government is really encouraging the methods of development. So uh, we see on the left um, in the past two years investments uh, in this space, mostly due to kind of the discourse surrounding the topic has been increasing at an incredible rate. And on the right, we can see uh, where most of these events and investments are taking place. So this is kind of a common trend that we've seen in China. So whenever they want to implement new policy, new initiatives, um, they take test cities, mostly tier one cities, uh, where they first implement these. And after uh, a test trial or a trial period, um, they begin to expand these to peripheral, reg uh, peripheral regions. So in terms of policy support, um, in December of 2021, the website of the Central Commission for Discipline and Expression of State Supervision and Commission released um, how the metaverse rewrites human social lives. So this is kind of a landmark um, where the Chinese government has really recognized the metaverse as a potential area of investment and development. And since then, um, committees and uh, other uh, publishings and research has been related, uh, released by the central government, which shows a really keen interest in uh, from the Chinese government towards this particular industry and space. Um, so here we want to briefly talk about uh, the ECNY. So uh, an issue for the Chinese or a roadblock for the Chinese metaverse is the uh, ban of cryptocurrencies, which is kind of the backbone of any metaverse uh, development all across the world because it's the central currency being uh, used in circulation. So in China, um, because of the, uh, they say, speculatory nature of cryptocurrencies is currently being banned. And from our projections, there is no uh, plans for it to be reinstated. So the alternative for this is the CE, CMY, or digital r &D. And uh, while this is in direct competition, we have to remember this is in direct competition to current uh, the current Alipay and WeChat Pay methods. So um, there will be some friction going forward, but as it is being heavily pushed by the uh, Chinese government, we can uh, predict that within the next five to 10 years, uh, the ECNY will be the standard form of payment or most uh, published form of payment in the metaverse or the digital ecosystem. Uh, next, Sharon will talk a bit about how um, Chinese companies are investing in the metaverse as well as the main players involved and their competitive advantages. Thank you, Hanyu. Um, so we have certainly witnessed a trend that um, uh, it has become a zeitgeist for the BAT companies to invest in metaverse. Uh, and there is a um, new um, a trend that uh, when we talk about BAT, it's more of a B for Binance instead of Baidu. And uh, statistic wise, uh, the search amount on Binance has surpassed uh, way much higher than the ones on Baidu. So Binance has become the biggest search engine in China. And uh, for Tencent, uh, with an advantage on games and uh, 3D contents, uh, Hanyu will elaborate more about their metaverse um, strategy. Uh, and for Biden, because they have such strong AI and AI GC capacities, uh, they are also um, very, uh, uh, they have also very positive strategies and the plans for um, metaverse. And um, to be honest, uh, many of the content now we browse on um, Douyin are from AI GC. Um, Huawei, certainly, they have this world leading 5G technologies which is making them one of the king of metaverse applications. Uh, they aim to build a virtual reality, uh, a virtual world covering all the content under a metaverse uh, scenario. And Alibaba has very rich consumer data. So they know the consumers and they provide solutions which is fulfilling the user needs. Um, so I will give the floor back to Han to look into how those players are uh, deploying all those metaverse strategies. Yeah, so, um, sorry, uh, so for the foundation of the metaverse's infrastructure, um, 
The uh, core will be built upon 5G, which will be the backbone of development of the metaverse. Uh, as we know, China currently has a leading position uh, within this industry. Uh, in particular, we can't ignore the presence of Huawei, which has really been pushing the technology in recent years. Um, so in the future, through during the development of the metaverse, uh, China will have a absolute advantage in this term uh, in regards to the, the foundational technology because of the presence of Huawei and its advancements in 5G. So uh, next, we kind of have to focus on how people are able to inter uh, interface with the metaverse via technology. So this is done mainly through three, uh, three, uh, three methods. Um, these are the current ones being applied uh, already. So first is virtual reality. Um, virtual reality can be understood as the creation of a most um, a, a, a simulation of, of a reality through a virtual space. Um, so this is mostly by glasses. Uh, I'm sure uh, some of you may have even tried it on, so to see a either augmented or completely recreated version of technology. So when people think of uh, virtual reality, many of us think about uh, perhaps digital twins or the recreation of technology. But um, the way that many firms or businesses are currently leveraging VR is that it's an elevated form of technology. So you're able to create designs, architectures, and uh, virtual spaces that surpass reality. And that's what really draws some people in. Um, second is augmented reality. Augmented reality is different from VR uh, in the sense that the uh, reality that you're seeing is not created or recreated, but rather um, a kind of imposed, uh, a superimposed version. So you have the real space, physical space in front of you. And then there are certain virtual aspects that are being added to this space. Um, I think an example that everyone is familiar with is Pokemon Go, um, and that's a uh, second way of application. So a third application um, is mixed reality. So this is the hybrid of virtual and real world environments that become indistinguishable. So this requires agreement for both VR and AR. Um, and this is, I would say, probably one of the uh, leading technologies for future application. Um, so the, the idea of mixed reality is that the transition between the real and unreal is so seamless that sometimes um, like it's even hard to recognize what is being animated and what is being real, uh, what is exactly real. So an example of this is motion capture. Um, next, we can look a bit at cloud computing. Um, so this part is basically focusing on how cloud computing uh, enables the creation of the future of the metaverse. So this is sim uh, similar to the aspect of decentralization I covered a bit earlier. So cloud computing, uh, cloud storage and rendering are key to lowering the hardware requirements and entry barriers. And this maximizes the number of users that can participate in the metaverse. Uh, and cloud rendering can also remotely construct high quality metaverse materials and digital content. Uh, data analytics, as well as AI can also be powered by cloud computing. So um, cloud computing, as well as edge computing, decentralization of the technological backbone of the metaverse is really what's going to enable uh, more powerful and more advanced applications of this uh, technology in the future. Uh, and of course, um, as we discussed a bit earlier, blockchain is the, I would say, key behind what enables the current metaverse. So. Um, for those of you who might not be uh, really familiar, the basics of blockchain. Um, so blockchain is an immutable record of transactions that tracks ownership and trading of digital assets. So the networks can be public, private, or permissioned, depending on who can access the blockchain. So public uh, blockchains are, uh, for example, you might be familiar with Bitcoin. Um, this is what we've mostly been seeing in the West. Um, private blockchains are uh, what companies usually uh, prefer because while they're, um, they can enjoy the benefits of the technological uh, capabilities of blockchain networks, um, they can keep a lot of data private, um, which of course is advantageous to them. Um, permission blockchains uh, currently uh, is a preferred model for many companies in China. So for example, Tencent, um, and they have developed uh, blockchain networks where uh, they can determine who can gain access to the blockchain. So this kind of uh, bridges the gap between uh, you know, the, the business applications as well as uh, public usage. 
Um, and so long story short, the basic of blockchain or the fundamental purpose of blockchain in the construction of uh, the metaverse is that it enables uh, first data security and as well as uh, the immutable record of transactions. So it's the true proof of digital ownership. So um, next we, I think this is a topic that many are interested in. So NFTs. Um, NFTs are financial securities made of digital data stored in a blockchain. So uh, in the metaverse, an NFT can be traded or owned by metaverse users. Um, unlike cryptocurrencies, which are interchangeable, uh, NFTs have no specific values. Um, each NFT is distinguished by its own ID code and metadata. And of course, ownership and, of an NFT is readily tracked in blockchain. So um, this is uh, where really the metaverse from the, the, between the West and China really begins to split or branch off. So in the West, um, NFTs are, uh, I think, a popular investment for many because there is a second, uh, second hand market where you can trade NFTs, um, which can really uh, expand or inflate in value. Um, in China, due to this speculatory nature, um, NFT trading has kind of been, uh, has been banned and they have been rebranded as digital collectibles. So now digital collectibles must be purchased through RMB and not through any existing cryptocurrency, which of course is also banned, and as well as secondary trading. So once you purchase the digital collectible, you are no longer able to sell it or have a trade against. And currently, um, in regards to the use of your digital collectibles, they're more for, um, uh, for brands to kind of uh, market themselves or for branding purposes. So. Uh, in China, there's uh, it, the purpose of NFTs is vastly different from the West. And next, uh, of course, AI. So machine learning and AI can uh, really boost the UX uh, user experience within the metaverse. Um, and this is another industry similar to 5G, where China has a very uh, big advantage in terms of the resources, experience, and uh, technologies available. So um, as uh, Sharon mentioned earlier, a lot of the content or virtual content that people in China are, see, uh, are seeing on Douyin um, is actually generated by AIs. So what these AIs do is they crawl um, different uh, pieces of news or articles all throughout the, uh, or scrape these inter pieces of information throughout the internet, and they're able to create actually uh, news articles on their own, which they're then able to distribute on channels like Douyin. So uh, in China, um, in terms of AI, there's already very, very innovative uh, applications, which um, are actually quite really seen in other countries. Um, last is digital twins. So digital twins is a very interesting aspect because there is, I would say, the business, uh, business internal management aspect um, and the retail e-commerce uh, or 2C aspect to it. So in terms of uh, uh, inter internal um, advantages, so there have been cases where digital twins have been used to monitor uh, the operation of factories or op uh, operations itself or digital uh, uh, systems or machinery. So what digital twin does is it creates a one-for-one -one copy of a real physical object within the digital space. So um, for example, just imagine you're operating a, a construction plant and there is a one-for-one -one copy of that same construction plant in the visual space. So you can track um, the entire flow of operation within the plant, you can see where the inefficiencies are, uh, and you can even run simulations. So without uh, actually producing a product, you can run simulations in production and identify certain pain points where you can address in real time. So uh, that's the application for uh, internal usage. And for more for uh, the 2C aspect of retail e-commerce, um, digital twin in the metaverse can allow people to shop in the virtual space with real-time updated data. So um, you can imagine this is almost a virtual mall where people are able to go into a uh, virtual space, um, be able to browse items. And once a item is sold out, um, this is communicated real -time, in real time to the consumer and creates an immersive digital shopping experience. Uh, here we'll go a bit into the leading players currently um, pushing the metaverse industry forward in the Chinese market. So uh, as Sean explained earlier, uh, first is Tencent. So in terms of Tencent, um, people here refer to the uh, to Tencent as the king of games, right? So um, you may know of some of these IPs that are currently uh, Tencent owns. So Riot Games uh, owns League of Legends, which is the single biggest uh, uh, video game currently um, in the market, and as well as with the largest player base. 
Um, Epic Games, uh, Fortnite Battle Royale, as well as Roblox. So these two games are uh, pioneers in the metaverse gaming industry. And uh, currently, um, in regards to the content they push, in regards to gameplay itself, there is no other game uh, that, or, or a popular game that even comes close to what these uh, games are being able to offer in terms of user experience. Um, so what Tencent uh, has um, in their hands, basically, first, the resources. Um, second, the experience. They have had uh, tons of uh, ownership. They have tons of control over a lot of IPs, and their team is directly involved with development and management of a lot of these IPs. So experience. And third, of course, capital. So they have what it takes to invest in the next generation of metaverse gaming. Um, Alibaba is a very interesting case um, because uh, I would say the force that they're currently exerting on how the metaverse is being shaped is a bit of a soft power. So what they deal with is um, data, user data. So across all of their platforms, uh, Ulama, which is a, a food delivery service, they have uh, AliExpress, Taobao, Tmall, Yuku, all sorts of different applications that are collecting massive amounts of user data in real time. And this really fuels or uh, funnels into the development of data analytics and AI. So um, during the development of their version of the metaverse, this huge amount of user data is able to transfer into the optimization of user experiences and as well as rec uh, user recommendations or other uh, options for optimizing for user experience. Um, of course, uh, another role that the uh, Alibaba has played in the formation of China's uh, metaverse is their huge digital ecosystem. So um, basically, as I said earlier, uh, from food delivery to online shopping, everything can be done through these applications owned by the Alibaba group. And all of these functions can be accessed in a single click from their Alipay app. So you go to their kind of uh, central app, which is Alipay. Um, you can order takeout. You can buy movie tickets. You can even send parcels. Um, so basically, it's a one-stop shop for everything you need in daily life. And that's really um, the, the central point of the metaverse, which is uh, interoper um, interoperability. And that's something Alibaba has achieved. Um, next is ByteDance. So like uh, Sharon has mentioned, ByteDance is actually replaced Baidu as the big B in the uh, four giants of China's big tech industry. Um, so uh, ByteDance is really focusing on user uh, user engagement and how to translate technology into uh, practical applications that is readily, accept readily accessible by the public. Um, so first is the acquisition of Pico. So uh, Pico is a VR headset maker um, and uh, it's the only Chinese tech firm to, uh, by then it's the only Chinese tech firm to acquire an extended reality hardware company. And this really sets the, the, the stage for the next step of ByteDance's uh, strategy for really connecting with the consumer, uh, which is uh, through VR. Um, also for ByteDance, uh, AI technology is a big aspect for them. So uh, as mentioned earlier, they have uh, many applications, including their generation of virtual content. Uh, lastly, um, though Baidu, I would not say is a huge player currently in uh, China's metaverse uh, space, um, they have made certain investments uh, that has participated in the push for the metaverse. So first is uh, Baidu's metaverse platform, Siram. So Siram is, um, you can imagine it similar to uh, Meta's uh, metaverse, which they develop. Um, however, for Siram, it's basically uh, a very, very centralized space. Um, so people can go into this place, um, the main hub called Creator City, where they can attend uh, you know, seminars, uh, where they can play some games, where they can even uh, interact with the space, but they're not able to manipulate the virtual environment. So they're not able to create their own content or anything. They're more guests than creators, um, which again is basically uh, one of the key uh, separations between the West and the East uh, China in terms of metaverse. Uh, last but not least, uh, we have to talk about Huawei's uh, telecom networks, which will be the key for the development of metaverse infrastructure. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, Huawei's expertise in 5G as well as uh, edge computing will be certainly a huge advantage for China in the coming years um, because of the infrastructure that Huawei has paved for the metaverse, um, which will enable the industry in China to have a much more streamlined development. Um, this is also being backed by the Chinese government. So the widespread usage of 5G, um, the uh, installation of 5G hardware across cities, 
Um, this, so Huawei's technology paired with the support from the Chinese government will certainly be a, a huge advantage for China in the development of the metaverse. So to conclude this section, um, the metaverse is, while uh, currently developing at a very fast pace, is still a long way from reaching its full potential in China. So the VR, um, AR from AR, VR to metahumans, um, currently the metaverse is still at a phase of what we call it normalization. So um, a lot of uh, the aspects of the metaverse, for example, metahumans is quite a new concept. So there is a lot of, uh, or a bit of pushback from the consumer and the community. So as of now, the metaverse is in, in a position where brands and uh, people who are actively creating practical applications uh, have to kind of educate their consumer or educate their base, uh, fan base about uh, how exactly, or convince them about how exactly the metaverse uh, can, be in, uh, uh, can be innovatively implemented into either advertising or other aspects of their business. Uh, next, uh, we'll go into the metaverse's diverse uh, retail applications and uh, Sharon will take over. Thank you, Han Yu. So next we will uh, delve into some of the typical applications of metaverse in China. And we've seen those with many MMCs who are um, dedicated to innovating. So the first application we're gonna talk about is about the metaverse shopping. Um, so the trend in China is still that uh, the e-commerce is um, still opening uh, up wild. We can see it uh, from the sales volume. It's still growing though with a, a smaller YOY growth. And also uh, net citizen amount is also growing. Um, so we have a very positive view on the uh, future of metaverse. And um, uh, who is the main client segmentation? The answer is the Generation Z. They are so curious. They need a lot of uh, social uh, platform um, um, content. So they are the main force for consuming metaverse content. So here is a case um, on Taobao's mid-year shopping carnival. Uh, the 618 uh, festival. So they launched this metaverse mall on Taobao. So shoppers can leverage their avatars and go through 3D stores uh, to consume. And they also provide this mini program, which is called uh, Buy Plus. So we can see here, there, uh, here is how it looks. Actually, Taobao has been long investing in this kind of metaverse shopping or at the very beginning called VR shopping programs. And it has been proved with high ROI. So one of the key findings they have is that consumers are spending more time with uh, with the product. Um, it's seven times more than uh, what they normally spend on Taobao. Also, it's bringing more conversions. There are seventy percent um, more conversion rates for the consumers. Um, also, it's because they take time to log in this metaverse platform. They are more, more motivated to consume. Um, another insight would be with the right platform and campaigns, the ROI could be relatively high. So Taobao had this 40, uh, 450% increase in ROI, but also you know it's because it's the mid-year mid um, shopping carnival uh, with big, big discounts. So choosing the right platform to work with is also extremely important under this uh, virtual shopping scenario. Um, so another trend we have seen is that um, cat catalyzed by the COVID-19, um, real-time VR uh, AR try-on has also been favored and welcomed by luxury brands and fashion brands. We can see here Gucci has been a big fan. They have uh, AR try-ons for accessories, uh, for apparel, for shoes, and even for bags. Um, also, as a pioneer in metaverse, uh, Nike also have plenty of those applications, even Farfetch. So for this, um, we mostly seen the applications, as I mentioned before, um, in the luxury, fashion, and the beauty industries. Um, but there are also critics um, having their um, concerns, which is also showing the way and then the next opportunity for AR try-ons, that is, they are arguing that there's no way of stimulating the feeling uh, when you are testing a product. Um, so how are we gonna make consumers feel the product in the metaverse could be a very criti critical um, topic. 
The second application we're gonna talk about is metahuman. So what is metahuman? So metahumans are basically um, virtual personas uh, built by uh, tech companies and sometimes brands. So some of them are owned by brands because uh, the brands want to have their uh, have metahumans as their exclusive assets uh, and to make sure that the metahumans are in line with the brand image. Um, and some of the metahumans are provided um, in templates um, for quick deployment on e-commerce um, um, channels. Uh, this we will have uh, cases on JD later. And some of the metahumans are operated directly by tech companies uh, as celebrities. So here we have a case of Ayai, which is the first official uh, virtual celebrity endorse, endorsing Timo Sto. Um, so there are certain advantage of working with metahumans um, as we had interviews with a very uh, experienced uh, digital leader, um, Ben. Uh, he's basically commenting that working with metahumans are bringing much lower risk because they don't have public um, persona meltdown and they wouldn't have any scandals. Also, sometimes they are cheaper, cheaper uh, for his industry for sure. And we have some other comments from the beauty industry is saying that if you work with smaller KOLs, it sometimes could be um, more expensive um, because the cost of building the right meta human and the right campaign is also very high, especially um, when you have very high brand standards. Uh, and the trend is really like uh, more and more Chinese consumers are embracing meta humans and they are so curious and willing to consume with meta humans. So here are three typical um, case studies of how the brands or the tech companies are leveraging their uh, metahumans. The first one is Luo Tian Yi. Um, I believe that many of our uh, attendees today are very familiar with the names um, because this is um, the biggest virtual idols or uh, what we call metahumans in China. It was invited by uh, CCTV uh, to join in the Spring Festival Gala in 2021. Um, and um, the second one would be Ayai, as I have uh, introduced it before. It's an official endorser for Timor. And the third one is Ling. So Ling is kind of iconic for metahumans because it's even uh, invited by uh, Gucci and Vogue to endorse their uh, campaigns. And um, it's also built by one of the leading scientists in China um, Ling is built by XMOF, um, and, and the very common um, uh, qualities all those metahumans have is they are actually all operated and built by startup companies, which is uh, fundraising and uh, having very good financial results. So another case study, uh, since we are talking about uh, virtual celebrities, uh, is about live streaming. So um, when we talk about uh, art or animation uh, industries, you're certainly gonna think about Bilibili. You certainly gonna think about uh, Douyin. So Bilibili has been a um, D uh, standard of, of metaverse uh, live streamers. So if today you log in uh, the chat rooms of Bilibili, you can see a hundred percent automatic virtual live streamers um, engaging and interacting with their fans. They dance, they sing, they even um, play cute in front of the, uh, their tea, uh, their tea um, uh, spenders. And uh, here you can see there is also like huge entertainment companies like Yuehua also um, uh, created uh, a animation singing group, which is called ASO. And uh, it is claiming itself to be uh, the highest earning VTubers in China. Uh, this is the data from 2021. Um, I'm sure there are some updates on Bilibili um, and certainly this is uh, interesting and attractive enough to Gen Z consumers and we still see this as a trend for brands to enter. So uh, we've talked about Bilibili. Uh, let's see uh, how it goes on um, Douyin. So as we've introduced it before, some companies choose to operate their own IP and leverage their IP for the conversion. So uh, Ethan, the little monk, this is the biggest uh, meta human or uh, number one uh, live streamer, virtual live streamer on Douyin. 
So how it goes is that um, the company behind the Yichan is basically creating stories to gain more, uh, gain a bigger fan base. At the same time, um, the virtual human, the meta human, uh, works with a uh, real human for uh, live streaming and commodity selling. So the company behind also uh, creates an OEM product uh, towards its fan base. For example, they have their own food brand, which is endorsed by Ethan. They have their own education uh, product, which is endorsed and branded uh, by the by Ethan. So this is how they uh, usually do on Douyin, and it's highly um, uh, conversion based. And um, another uh, application is also what we mentioned that uh, when companies provide kind of templates for fast deployment on e-commerce platforms. So this is Nescafe's uh, JD store. And if when a consumer enters the JD store, uh, you can click on the uh, virtual uh, MetaHuman um, chat room. And when you enter, it's actually showing you all the positive uh, comments from previous buyers. And it's gonna pop out recommendations based, based on your uh, consumer profile. However, uh, this kind of MetaHuman has very limited um, interactions capacities. So if you want to have a, a integrated and comprehensive um, experience in this chat room, you will still need to um, resort to the uh, chat bot, which is uh, also, show, uh, also circled here on the screenshot. So when you have questions, you ask the AI chat bot, but when you, um, when you want to uh, have check, check some uh, most recent uh, comments and the uh, information, you just uh, engage with the meta human. And this is a, this, this takes more than one week to set up. So it's a very cost efficient way of uh, starting with the meta human. So uh, the other thing about the uh, quick rise um, and the, the uh, concerns from consumers, I will, I will invite Han Yu to uh, introduce. Hello, Han Yu. Thanks, Sharon. So, um... Despite the quick rise, virtual influencers is still an immature market. Um, so I actually want to start on the right of this slide uh, for now. So doubts and limitations. Um, virtual influencers cannot speak for reality. So uh, a very famous case of, uh, I would say, a failure of the implementation of virtual human uh, is me. So she made a comment um, that a lipstick felt moisturizing and not dry. And this kind of uh, put a stop to that suspension of disbelief when we talk about virtual influencers, uh, because um, the reaction to this is a lot of people commenting. So, as you know, a virtual uh, a virtual entity, how are you able to feel the physical um, texture of lipstick? And that was really where the backlash uh, started. And this is not just the case for Ling. So. Um, there's a there's been a lot of skepticism and uh, controversy regarding. Uh, the, legitimacy, the legitimacy of these claims being made by uh, virtual influencers or virtual idols, um, especially when it comes to uh, things or their opinions that could be a bit far-fetched for what is capable of a virtual influencer. Um, uh, as opposed to this, uh, there's another uh, campaign um, that was, I think, handled quite well, and that was the collaboration between AI, uh, I think you may remember her from some earlier slides, uh, and Mac, uh, the beauty company. So uh, what they did was um, there was a product uh, for skin um, that really wanted to emphasize how uh, did, uh, they made the skin immaculate and uh, perfect. And it emphasized on this really healthy, healthy glow of the skin after the application of the product. So for this particular campaign, they chose the meta human uh, IA. Um, and what the, the, the message that they want to convey is that through this product, um, your face or skin will have the same immaculate texture, the same uh, immaculate glow as a meta human. So it's so perfect that it can only be achieved by something that's not real. Um, and that was quite an innovative uh, campaign on their end. And, uh, it resulted in a very positive response from the online community. So when it comes to the application of MetaHumans, it's a very, uh, it's quite tricky. It's a very thin line um, between what is acceptable and what is could be a bit considered a bit far-fetched. Um, another positive example of uh, MetaHuman application is the uh, 
Angie, created by Tiny CGI uh, creator Jesse Jung. So she was, um, I think, one of the pioneers of what we say uh, called body positivity medicines. Um, and uh, she created very positive influence on social media by advocating that uh, for simple beauty and that women can uh, pursue a comfortable and self-fulfilling life. So um, for Angie, she was quite, uh, I would say she's uh, very proprietary as well because this was the first application of a metahuman where um, it really touched upon the, uh, the real aspects of, uh, of how to implement a metahuman or make it similar to the humans in the real world and really this campaign to the spot in China. Uh, back to you, Sharon. Thank you, Hai. The next application we're going to talk about is Metaverse Collectibles, also uh, as what we call as Digital Collectibles. Um, so Metaverse Collectibles are content uh, to be gifted. Uh, the reason why we use the word gifted is also because, as we all know before, uh, the Chinese government is having a very um, conservative stance on um, the, the trades of N NFTs. So mostly uh, for the current marketing campaigns, we see uh, those uh, digital collectibles are being gifted. And we can see also here um, the booming of uh, digital collectibles are booming the industry. Uh, there are more and more companies which is marketing into this digital collectible uh, field. And the two of the most classic uh, marketing campaigns um, leveraging digital collectibles are actually from two uh, wine brands. The first one is um, um, Zhilan. It's actually a luxury uh, wine brand in China. So uh, it's created NFTs, which is uh, based on its classic uh, wine brand. So Whenever you uh, have the NFTs, you are recognized as a VIP uh, of the brand. And whenever there are limited versions uh, launching the uh, stores, you have the privilege of purchasing uh, a hat and they actually provide you with coupons and discounts. Um, the same is, is actually very classic in the uh, Chinese stock market um, is, the, is this one. So it's called the master of wine. Um, the, the, the concept is selling is really like whenever you uh, successfully uh, made your why in the game, you will be, um, you will be gifted with a real bottle of wine. wine. And um, um, this is how it pitches its ideas. But um, the feedback from the netizen is not that positive because it's saying that it's not that consumer, uh, like user friendly, and it's super, super hard to get uh, a real bottle of wine. But the, the concept is there and it's actually, and the certainly uh, grabbing the eyeballs of consumers. Um, the other two classic um, case studies are actually one from Manio and the other, of, uh, the other one from Rowie. So uh, as we all know, the Manio and Ili, they are the masters of leveraging their products with um, um, virtual ideas. So I'm, I'm very sure for the Chinese attendees we have today, um, a lot of you must have been participating in all those kind of uh, uh, kind of campaigns, right? Where you, you purchase a bottle of milk and then you, you, are a, you have this privilege of uh, voting for your uh, idols for, for a show. So here they are actually uh, twerking this idea with NFTs. So whenever you consume a carton of milk, you get one digital collectible and with this collectibles, uh, they are gift gifting you with, uh, with the credits in a game. And in this game, you actually uh, have a farm. Whenever you farm, you, get a, uh, you, have more you gain more credits, you farm more, and then in the, in the end, you're gonna grow another carton of milk in the game, or they're gonna endow you with more game items. So, which is actually creating a closed loop for the, uh, for the users. Um, and the other uh, case, which is from Rowi, so um, Rowie launched its first NFT uh, in 2022, and it's uh, it's claiming it's claimed to be the first uh, uh, NFT campaign within the automotive industry. So what they do is they did an auction. So uh, this auction is um, on the table. It's selling a NFT, which is which is uh, the first uh, NFT from Rowie. But under the table, it's actually selling a real car. 
But the, uh, the, the, the privilege they're offering the consumer is that uh, you will, it will be a bespoke product. Whatever you say, however you picture it, um, row we gonna provide the prototype, prototype based on your request. So you're gonna, you, got, you get an F, NFT, you get a real car and you've got customization services. So in the end, the auction uh, finished at 1 million RMB. Uh, this is also revealing a trend as I was discussing with Hai yesterday. Um, we believe that the entity of NFTs and the real value of NFTs is, hasn't still be, uh, been widely recognized by the Chinese, Chinese consumers. Uh, that's the reason why the brands are gifting those NFTs. And in the end, um, the, the ultimate goal is the exchange of, of consumer uh, products. Um, hi, uh, do you want to um, share some insights on this slide? Yes, yeah, so uh, here are some uh, insights on uh, the cases of digital collectibles uh, in China. So um, on the left, we see the selling true digital collectible clothing. So for uh, netizens, there were a lot of positive responses to uh, this uh, new trend. So first, virtual fashion can be a lot more sustainable con uh, compared to the traditional fashion industry. And second, um, I think, uh, is, which is the main point, is that virtual boutiques are not limited by real world factors. Uh, so uh, gravity, light wind, um, and even design. So as you can see from a lot of the designs on the left, uh, the, uh, the clothes are very futuristic and uh, simply impossible to achieve in real life. And the virtual, uh, the augmented reality aspect of this really gives um, even just the common consumer or anyone the chance to try on these really fantastical clothes. Um, also, of course, there's the aspect of price. So you can try on, for example, for more, uh, for, for a lot of pieces of clothing, you don't actually have to pay a large sum of money to try on uh, clothes that you, a mother or wife, would not be able to procure. Um, however, there are some uh, negative reactions as well. So first, uh, what is the difference with Photoshop? So um, a lot of people think that um, a lot of these clothes might be a bit too gimmicky and they just don't really understand the um, difference between an NFT or digital collectible and simply, uh, you know, photoshopping the image or adding something through, uh, you know, Photoshop or paint. So um, this kind of uh, goes back to the aspect of educating the consumer or educating um, the audience. So make sure that during campaigns, you really get to the message across or make it clear that um, the, the advantages or the tangible or uh, the immutability of NFTs or digital collectibles. Um, so uh, some other significant examples is uh, a virtual sneaker by RTI KFT, which sold for um, a huge sum of money in China, which was one of um, the biggest transactions for uh, non uh, for digital collectibles in China. Um, some other aspects or applications include uh, a kind of a merging between the futuristic technology of NFT digital collectibles and traditional Chinese culture. Um, so the creation of the uh, Chinese NFT artist Song Ting as well as Flowered Landscape, which was an uh, uh, NFT collection inspired by traditional Chinese art and poetry. Okay, thank you, Hanyu. Um, so the next uh, application we're gonna talk about, um, I'm, I'm sure uh, many of the audience today are very familiar, familiar with, because um, many of, uh, we, we did a small interview with the uh, um, the friends and the clients around us. 80% um, of them are claiming they have um, been participating in a metaverse kind of event. Um, so application-wise, uh, we've seen uh, typical uh, scenarios for, uh, for like what we can see here for fashion shows, uh, for concerts, for business meetings, uh, including some kind of launch events and the strategic partnership signing. Uh, also, it's capital catalyzed by the COVID situation because people can't really meet before. Um, also including sports events, um, um, educations, even pictures and exhibitions. These are all typical uh, applications of metaverse events. Um, the advantages of metaverse events are really like, um, they are very convenient to set up. Also, uh, it's the same to MetaHumans. There are plenty of templates where you can just update some of your current brand information and have it set up as, as simple as Zoom. And it's a way for people to really engage and meet and interact with all the 
different kind of uh, virtual contents. Some, some, some of them are 2D, some of them are 3D. So uh, there are a lot of different of ways of uh, organizing your campaign. And um, um, there are also um, uh, one of the interview we, we had, um, which is uh, backing meta events a lot. Their companies had more than, I would say more than five campaigns based on the metaverse events and all, uh, all get very positive feedback. So to believe for a macro perspective, the demand for um, metaverse events are still coming. And um, the startups or to say the providers, the service providers, they need to have iterative versions uh, to make sure that every time the consumers or the users are coming to their platform, they, real, they, they, they still feel something new and they feel immersive. Um, so this is also one thing uh, the brands should consider. So what kind of experience you're going to provide your, uh, to your consumers? Um, because metaverse content could be a very, um, very simple level, which is you just provide some 2D content based on the template. It can also be totally complicated, which is uh, combined with your social media campaign, combined with your brand image, um, and all those kind of things. So it could be huge. It could be small. Um, it's totally depends on how your company, how your leaders are visioning this, um, the, this, this metaverse concept. Because at the very beginning, the ROI is not uh, very promising. Um, whatever you're saying, meta human, meta events, uh, digital collectible, uh, it's not sure. But some companies, they have a very open mindset. For example, Nike, they even um, opened up their own digital content, content studio, which is only dedicating to the content of Nike. Um, so other companies are really like, uh, okay, we're not sure how it's how it's gonna go, right? It's not it's a hard market. We're gonna ensure that um, this year will be a good year for us. So it really depends on the on the uh, mindset of companies. Um, another um, thing about metaverse events. So there are certainly strengths and weaknesses, and I've mentioned some of them um, before already. So it's convenient, it's immersive. Um, some of them are immersive, but when you've been there a lot, uh, especially when you've been on the same platform a lot, it's less immersive for you, honestly speaking. Um, and the weakness is, uh, yeah, sometimes the init initial cost could be high, but we see the trend is uh, that um, different different players are lowering down their uh, package prices now because more uh, companies are coming into this uh, industry. And um, uh, still uh, about the brands, especially high-end brands, how you're going to align this platform with your brand image, with what your marketing department is asking you, uh, that's taking a lot of effort and energy. Also, the uncertain ROI I have mentioned before. So uh, it's not only you, you need to convince. Uh, convince. It's also about um, the department you are working with, uh, your leader, sometimes even your CEO, uh, whether they are into this idea and wh whether they are uh, willing to make the investment. So as uh, Hayu has mentioned before, 5G is crucial in this um, whole metaverse, metaverse kind of thing. So you want to you, you want to make sure your metaverse event is uh, real time. You want to make sure that it's not like after one or two minutes that you are experiencing uh, whatever happened before, right? So 5G would still be a key infrastructure all the companies and all the users need to um, be a part of. So there are two more cases, which is, uh, um, I believe, very close to many of the attendees we have today. So uh, during the 2020 Shanghai Fashion Week, there is a brand called the Loose Mile. Um, they have this 100% uh, metaverse um, launch um, in Roblox. It's not the Roblox China, it's more like um, uh, the Roblox uh, in the United States. So the designers, they actually have um, the digital wearables inside Ro uh, Roblox, also have her offline autumn and winter uh, collect collections uh, released on e-commerce stores. So if you are a consumer, you can both buy the digital wearables, which is a, a wearable in Roblox and Decentraland. And uh, uh, also the, the, the offline physical objects, they are 100% identical. So it's more like an o OMO, OMO kind of uh, concept. So we also have seen other kind of um, um, like shows on Shanghai Fashion Week with the concept of metaverse, but it, those are not really metaverse because they just have some kind of a 3D content or 3D effect. Um, but this is also a trend in China, it's hard to really define um, the, the concept of, uh, of metaverse. 
a lot of people are trying to use this concept, uh, but uh, what is what is really the concept and what is really uh, bringing the consumer is the experience and um, how you leverage the online and offline uh, interaction. Another, uh, another, another campaign is uh, how Adidas and Tencent have this uh, metaverse concert. So it has been proven as a big success because the event alone has attracted more than uh, 1 million participants and they have very positive feedbacks because they, they, they kind of met their idols inside the game. So um, the conclusions we have today and the takeaways, um, the first one would be that, um, as we have mentioned before, the BAT companies, uh, so which is also what's called BBAT today um, with Biden, they are ambitious into the idea of metaverse and that they are eager to take market share early. Um, and the second takeaway would really be like, metaverse is the, the frontier for game and uh, especially retail. Um, so brands are setting up their metaverse assets early, including like meta humans and their own metaverse venues and the digital collectibles. And um, they are eager to know how they can leverage those kind of technologies to build up campaigns to merge with the, the, the five piece. And um, you need to be fast. And whatever is successful by your brand in other countries is not necessarily going to be successful in China. The third one would really be like, um, if you want to be, if you want to try metaverse uh, events, collectibles, and metahumans could be the first steps you are taking. And thanks to the market and the, thanks to the startups, they are providing more and more affordable uh, solutions for uh, big big brands and small brands to to start. And um, in the retail industry, these are I, I will say these are really becoming common. And if you want to let still leverage the metaverse idea and attract consumers, it is the right time to make the investment. Um, Han Yu, uh, for further takeaways, would you um, walk our audience with? Yeah, uh, so first China's metaverse uh, will understandably be very centralized and the government will be quick to implement measures preventing fraud or otherwise. Um, so as a brand, uh, there are many cases where you have to be agile um, when certain regulations change or policies are impl implemented. Um, however, the metaverse uh, industry or environment in China currently, despite all the regulations currently booming and developing very fast, um, so there will be first mover advantages and uh, in order to take the position or leading position and engage with consumers, um, brands need to act fast uh, and act uh, in an agile manner in order to uh, capture or take advantage of the novelty of the both concept and the industry. Um, next, uh, the metaverse in China is still in its infancy stage. So um, while it's developing at a very fast pace, we have to understand that um, you know, whether it's the perception of the consumer, which needs to develop, or if it's the hardware limitations, hardware software limitations, um, there's still a very, very long way for the metaverse to go in China. Um, so, I mean, an example would be uh, VR glasses, right? So they're not really a commodity. Um, you don't see a VR glass uh, in every household. Um, and this could be something that's a subject to change in uh, very fast, so in the next five years even. Um, so there is a very promising future for China's metaverse. Um, and last, uh, China owns world leading infrastructures, including 5G and a local tech ecosystem, which will provide a diversified supply, uh, supply chain resources. Um, so thanks to the government backing behind uh, the tech sector and uh, the relevant hardwares, China will be a very cost efficient market to deploy metaverse strategies, and uh, it will be certainly one of the go to countries for companies who wish to advance uh, in the metaverse game. Um, and that concludes our webinar for today. So. Um, in the next 10 to 15 minutes, we'll be hosting a Q&A session. So uh, if any of you have any questions that uh, you'd like us to answer, uh, feel free to post your question in the Q&A section. So um, I see we already have two questions. So uh, first is, do you have an AI system, uh, such an uh, equivalent AI system as Midjourney or DALI? So for those who don't know, um, Midjourney and DALI are AI image generating um, uh, software. So basically, it's a text to image software where you type a certain a concept of text and this translates into an AI generated image. 
So in terms of China, uh, there is a similar uh, a software that's been developed. So it's called Ernie uh, VILG. I'll send it in the group chat for uh, all to see. So this is a software that's been developed by Baidu and it functions similar to the two previously mentioned ones. But um, the real selling point for this in China's context is that it recognizes Chinese text. So you can try type uh, things in Chinese and that will translate to imagery. Um, one, uh, another interesting thing to mention about this particular software is that uh, there's uh, censorship involved in, uh, in the program. So um, certain sensitive keywords or certain sensitive geographic locations uh, will not be generated if you attempt to uh, type it in or generate related images. Um, the, okay. Sharon, do you have anything to add? Uh, sorry, uh, thank you for your question, Agnes. Uh, I just want to add one quick uh, platform because uh, uh, for consumers, they tend to have, uh, t they tend to uh, try the uh, AI generation um, on uh, some very, uh, on some more general and public platforms. For example, actually you can experience uh, AIGC, I mean the graphic ones on, uh, on Biden's platforms. The first one is uh, the, 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 the picture processing uh, software, which is called Tinku. So you can actually, uh, it, it's totally 100% free. So whenever you upload a picture, um, the software will just generate this AI content uh, based on the picture you are inputting. Um, and there are some other um, apps, uh, which is basically leveraging the um, foreign APIs and they're trying to grab the uh, trend and make some fast money. But I would say for the content and the AI GC, Binance is definitely um, the big player in China. Yeah, yeah, um, but certainly, and you understand that, like, I think, like, the genius of uh, companies in China is really how practical they can be. So, you know, while in the West, a lot of um, uh, of these applications are hard to access for the general public, in China, they've already made very practical applications um, that can be used by just uh, anyone, and it's really been generating a buzz uh, in certain platforms, as you mentioned, May too. Um, so the second question, uh, also by Agnes, do you have any more info about the state-backed uh, NFT platform launched this year? Um, so it indeed, uh, the plan launches, I think January 1st of uh, this year. Um, so this is, I would say, um, it's a bit difficult to answer because right now it's so early in its development. Um, what's, interest, what, what's interesting to note is that um, out of the partners who kind of came together to build this platform, one of these is the Cultural Relics Exchange. Um, so, you know, that really hints that this platform is very, uh, it's very centralized, it will be controlled, heavily monitored, monitored by the uh, Chinese uh, relevant parties within the Chinese government. Um, certainly, there won't be as much uh, freedom or uh, of um, by the, or freedom of participation by individual users. Um, so, we, we kind of imagine this as a platform where, you know, maybe certain uh, Chinese historical elements are being shared in the form of NFTs. Um, and uh, from there, it's pretty much a very controlled and very regulated environment. Yeah, sure. Just, uh, I just want to add a small background for this. Um, it's a very good question, because this is also one of the heated topics uh, for people in China uh, these days. So I think last week, uh, the Chinese store market has this, um, um, this, this, this um, sudden rise for the uh, metaverse topic stocks. Um, it was a really like a, um, like, like a, like a boom. Uh, but for Chinese government, there's also, uh, there's always one thing. So they kind of put a concept, uh, first of all, and then they see how the market is reacting to it. So we, we, we've seen that for this uh, uh, state-backed NFT trading platform, so, which is uh, allowing the users to trade uh, within each other, which is more like a, a typical NFT format. So it's claiming to, to be set up, but whether in the end it's gonna be there uh, or how it will be uh, is still a question mark. Right, um, so we also have a question about um, China's ban on crypto. And so with China's ban on crypto, how can its metaverse be iterable? So for example, how could a uh, board be in China's metaverse? And also um, due to China's ban uh, on NFTs uh, being uh, because of their definition as securities, 
Um, what about general blockchain utilities such as NFT as a certificate of authenticity? So this is um, a very, very good question. Uh, so in China, um, blockchain technology is being implemented, but uh, it's, you know, what we like to say with Chinese characteristics. So the, uh, the backbone of Chinese, uh, China's uh, uh, blockchain infrastructure is the BSN, which is um, a basically blockchain network that runs crypto lists. Um, and that's very much different from everywhere else in the world. Um, and in regards, uh, so for the question, like how could a board ape be in China's metaverse? So I, I think the quick answer would be like, it's, I don't think it can because it function is fundamentally kind of different from the West. And in the future, we're really uh, expecting to see kind of an isolated environment in China. So there's China's metaverse and then there is the global metaverse. Uh, and uh, Sharon, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, it's a very good question. Um, so. There is actually a recent um, collaboration case from one of our partner and the uh, board app. So um, it's not in metaverse, but it's yes. in China. So they have this, uh, they are a real estate player, but they also have this um, co-working space. Uh, so in order to gain more traffic and attract more consumers, they have this uh, monthly kind of uh, uh, motif from different kind of IPs. So uh, board app was one of their partners. So um, it's, I mean, uh, board app is kind of like the uh, the cover of, of NFTs for Chinese consumers. So they are definitely attracted uh, by board app and the metaverse idea. So again, it's, I mean, it's, it's mostly used as a gift, as a concept. So uh, it's not really technology related, but uh, it's, it's like a myth. Human beings are born curious, right? So it's like a myth. It's widely used in China. It's cashing out in China, but it's not related to technology. Yeah, exactly. That actually reminds me, um, I think uh, Li Ming, so the Chinese fashion brand, they actually did a campaign with uh, Board Ape a while back. Um, so exactly like what Sharon said, so um, it, the tech aspect of it won't be in China, but certainly like Board Ape as a face of NFTs, there's a strong marketing, um, there's strong marketing opportunities for it. So uh, it's actually quite, I think, polarized. So um, it can be in China, but obviously not in the same form that it's been in the West. Yep. Uh, um, I think uh, we can finish the last question. Uh, so basically right. it's a blockchain utility question. Um, so we've seen cases like this before. Because uh, I was I was working in uh, Slush with uh, China before. It's a tech conference which we have like in average hundreds of startups pitching every year. So there are, are some startups uh, even start to work on the blockchain technologies before this uh, metaverse um, trend. So um, they have they certainly have uh, deals and the co creation um, opportunities with uh, multinational corporates on leveraging. Um, NFTs as a certificate of authenticity. So uh, it's mostly seen in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, also in the uh, retail industry. Um, but the trend here in China for the uh, retail industry is more like, uh, I think it's uh, because the Catholic and the Uniqlo has done such a great job on the uh, RFID solution. And RFID has been very cheap in China. So. Currently, uh, they don't see a must go trend for, um, for, for it. Um, but uh, um, my personal feeling is that it's gonna be a trend and it's gonna be um, encouraged because uh, the government is so much endorsing all the tech companies and trying to um, make the market vibrant again. So yeah, uh, using blockchain utilities uh, for authenticity is definitely a doable business in China. Right. Um, I think. Uh, oh, that there's uh, there's one last question, and uh, due to time constraints, I think that will be the last question that we'll be taking today. Um, so, if any of our listeners have uh, further questions, uh, feel free to reach out to us by email or personal contact, and we'll try to respond. Um, so, the last question is: So, if Prada issues a Aura blockchain certificate as an NFT. A Chinese person won't really be able to interact with it, uh, even if Prada makes it as a gift after buying some clothes. 
Um, so the idea of brands issuing NFTs. So it, I think the, the answer to this question is quite. Uh, it, you need to look at it from the consumer's perspective. So when uh, someone from China perhaps buys or acquires an NFT from a certain brand, um, they do it because they, they they love the brand. They're fans of the brand, and you know within their community, the NFT essentially can serve as a bragging right. So the, the way that Chinese consumers perceive NFTs, it's, um, it's, it's not in, uh, I would say a, a kind of a asset kind of mindset. So when someone from the West buys an NFT, uh, they know that they can resell this. Uh, this has a certain value outside of the value that it gives them or the utility it gives them personally it has an external value. But when someone from China buys an NFT, they do it personally, uh, a specific, uh, solely for the emotional benefits it provides them um, and out of love for the brand. So um, it really, it, to answer this, I think um, it's really because of how the Chinese consumer perceives an NFT. Yeah, I agree with you. And it's like, uh, I think the answer will, if we take one extreme, it will be the Chinese consumer can interact with it in all the means other than selling it again. So they can, uh, they are, the, the, all the other interactions are accessible. It's just like they cannot really sell it. Um, they they can they can take it as a gift for sure. And um, it's just like it's, it's even fine to uh, take those as coupons. You know, it's like if you if you just buy a certain amount of uh, things and they just give you NFT as coupons, it's also fine. It's just like they cannot sell it. Um, so I think that uh, concludes our webinar for today. So thank you so much uh, for sharing, for joining me for today's webinar. Um, and thank you for everyone who participated. Uh, we hope you, you know, learned something uh, new today about the metaverse in China. And uh, thank you for tuning in. Okay, thank you. Um, so Last in the end, I think, yep, yeah, uh, please go ahead. No, sorry, Sharon. Go. Okay. So lastly, we're gonna briefly introduce a little bit about our companies. And uh, if you, uh, if uh, any of our audience might have further questions that we don't have time to cover today, uh, feel, feel free to contact us. So about AYO, uh, our brand is very easy to remember. It's, it's actually uh, literally standing for Are You OK? Uh, the Leijing joke. So when Leijing was uh, having this Are You OK? Um, like news in India, we registered the brand without any hesitation. So uh, what we do is digital innovation consulting. Uh, we help our clients to uh, find disruptive tax and um, basically help them to uh, build new growth points based on the technology. So are you okay is actually making sense. Uh, are you ready to innovate? And um, uh, what we do with our clients are that we build POC uh, projects. Uh, it's a full process uh, service we we'll provide. And uh, those are some of our cases. Uh, for example, this is a medical cases, uh, medical case, open medical case we did with Sanofi, a top 10 pharmaceutical company. And this is what we did with Takeda, uh, a pharmaceutical company, which is uh, dedicated to rare diseases. Um, this was uh, a POC which we've done with L'Oreal. This is our, their first virtual um, um, celebrity uh, going with the brand MD. And this is the case we have uh, built with uh, Airbus. It, this is a flexible screen uh, application inside the cabinet. Um, because you know, for uh, aeroplane kind of companies, they are really, really uh, concerned, conservative. Uh, speaking of adopting new technologies, it has been, I don't know, more than five years. And uh, I heard that they are planning to launch it next year. This is, a, this is another um, <clears throat> Medical Plus pro uh, project, which is designed for uh, Parkinson's um, patients. Uh, this actually helped them to um, to eat um, normally because uh, when you shake, it's actually very hard for uh, the uh, the patients to eat. And uh, uh, thanks to this device, the the the, the, the HCPs uh, like the physicians are able uh, to to really evaluate uh, the disease progress of the patient. So these are the companies uh, we've worked with. So mostly uh, pharmaceutical companies and the retail companies. Um, some of them we work with, uh, most of them we work with uh, the, the, the China company. Also, there are some global cases. Um, so this is our contact. If you have any question about the metaverse, about the anything in China, about innovation, um, do not hesitate to uh, contact us, write to us. Uh, it's very simple, innovation at ruok.com. Thank you, uh, Harry. I will leave the floor to you.
Uh, thank you, Sharon. Uh, we'll also share a bit about uh, Dasha Consulting. Sorry, one sec. Uh, so Dasha Consulting, we're a strategic consulting and market research company based in China. Um, so uh, we've just recently celebrated our 10 year anniversary. Um, we are uh, based, our head office in China, Shanghai. Uh, we have uh, 30 full-time consultants and uh, aside from full national coverage in China, we've also offered consulting services uh, throughout the whole APAC region uh, and Asia overall. Um, so as of now, um, here it says 350, but as of now we have over 400 clients uh, and 600 projects over the past 10 years. We've worked across numerous industries um, and we're particularly strong in fashion, uh, beauty, as well as FMB. Um, so we're a research-driven uh, consulting company. So we're, uh, everything we do is organized in-house. We don't outsource any of our research processes. Um, and our insights are gathered through internal, uh, completely through in-house research. Um, our services include uh, brand audits, uh, audience, uh, target audience profiling, and we're particularly have been focusing on market research at go to market, as well as market expansion strategies. Um, our, our methodologies uh, are uh, tailored specifically to um, particular types of projects, as well as the particular types of industries. So sometimes, um, while well, this is a basically a benchmark or framework of the methodologies that we most commonly use, um, we often shift or tweak certain steps within methodology to uh, optimize it for particular projects. Uh, as here, we uh, we have been quoted by numerous news agencies uh, throughout the world, as well as within currently within China. And this is our context. So uh, same with Sharon, um, if you have any questions related to uh, the metaverse or the support, um, feel free to reach out to us through uh, LinkedIn, uh, you can, uh, tune into our newsletter or through WeChat. Um, in regards to this particular report, uh, we'll be sending out a copy to uh, those who are currently in attendance. And uh, you can also check out the report on our website. Uh, and I think that concludes, uh, officially concludes our webinar for today. So again, uh, thank you so much for attending um, and uh, sharing again, thank you so much for co-hosting with me and uh, uh, have a good night.